Dear clickers, dear friends, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome all of you to attend uh, the second lecture by Compenson, uh, Professor Compenson. Uh, uh, I, I will take the pleasure to make a short introduction to Professor Compenson again, since uh may some uh say some new friends uh may come in so quite short this is the uh, uh speak polite Pro professor from basin mm. uh he is contemporary famous and powerful logician and philosopher uh he received Two master degrees in mathematics and in philosophy, and a PhD of mathematics. Right now, he is university professor emeritus, University of Amsterdam. Henry Stewart, professor, a uh, chair professor, uh, Stanford University. Uh, Jin Yuan Lin, professor at Tsinghua University, uh, and the core director, uh, University of Amsterdam and Tsinghua Joint Research Center in Logic. He is the founding director, Institute for Logic, Language, and uh, Compu Computation, uh, Amsterdam. First president and all member European Association for Logic, Language, and Information. Recipient Dutch National Spinoza Award. Uh, he had been elected as member Royal Dutch Academy of Arts and Sciences. Academy, European Pan, uh, International Institute of Philosophy, uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, International Academy of Philosophy of Science, uh, has many research interests general logic, in particular, model theory and uh, model logic, correspondence theory, temporary logic, dynamic, epistemic logic, fixed point logics, application of logic to philosophy, linguistic, computer science, social sciences, uh, cognitive science uh, uh, has publication so many, not least here. Uh, has the milestone in his life, uh, 1999, to publish the collection of essays to celebrate his 50th birthday. Cause of the land, the famous jailer, important jailer, jailer of philosophic logic, to publish a special issue to celebrate his 60th birthday. Cause of 19, uh, farewell and legacy events, University of Amsterdam, that is. He taught from Amsterdam uh, At the same year, published the outstanding contributions value. Johan uh, uh, von Benson on logic and information dynamics. House of 17, uh, has done 
scientific publications may be including manuscripts uh, deposited in uh, I don't know how to pronounce the name. Uh, House of the Lantin, uh, uh, both at Amsterdam and Tsinghua, uh, uh, separately organized a uh, workshop to celebrate his 60th birthday. Yes, in pra personal impression. As I look, Professor von Benson is a very powerful person, always active and especially creative. His brain is full of new ideas, covers very widely from logic to philosophy, linguistic, computer science, social sciences, and cognitive science and achieved important contributions in many fields, especially in logic. Very good at design of academic projects and organization of academic activities. Always energetic, busy with pushing something forward. Very interesting and funny talk. Go that make jokes. Moreover, he is a very friendly person, whether to, to students or to critics. Yes, I get a few words introduction to Dr. Fan Da, uh, the interlocutor tonight. Uh, Fan Da, he get an engineer bachelor in engineer uh, in Jilin University, China. Then he get a master degree in philosophy from Taiwan Chenggong Dafie. Then he get a PhD in philosophy from University of California at Davis, uh, United States. Right now, he is a post-doctor working with me, Wuhan University. Uh, he starts to publish English papers in such general as CSS uh, and something else. His area of specialization, philosophy of language, is partially conditional, formal semantics and uh, pragmatics. <coughs> Epistemology, especially contextualism. Areas of competence, logic, cognitive science, philosophy of science, metaphysics. Yes, as usual. Yeah. Uh, hello, we welcome Professor Van Benson give his second uh, lecture in the face of logic and epistemology. Uh, he talks more than one hour. Uh, uh, then, uh, Dr. Fan Da will give his short comments and questions at most 15 minutes. The audience, please write down your question in chat room. The staff at Xue Xu Zi will forward your questions to us. Then, Professor Van Benson will give uh, his short replies. Professor von Benson really expects the question from the audience. Now, welcome to, uh, welcome Professor von Benson to, uh, to the, his second lecture. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me? Okay. Everything okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Then I, yeah. I, I will start. Um, I think this is not 
quite right what I'm doing here. So I'll try again. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, a pleasure to uh, give this uh, second uh, companion lecture to uh, the lecture I gave last week. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Chambo, for your introduction. Uh, it sounded like the one you gave last week, so at least uh, what I conclude from this is that um, my first lecture didn't give you a negative impression, so that you changed uh, your views uh, of me, and it's uh, good to see the information about my uh, respondent later on. So, um, <clears throat> what I'd um, like to uh, do today is uh, talk about another interface between logic and epistemology, but uh, before I get there, I have a sort of transitional topic. So my topics are going to be knowledge, the role of inference, and then eventually uh, a consequence. So my transitional topic is actually about what inference does. And um, this is something that um, poses a bit of a challenge when you think about what inference does with knowledge. So in our first lecture, uh, information updates was connected with knowledge. And uh, I was interested in information updates and uh, how knowledge changes because of that. And um, so this was about shrinking or otherwise modifying uh, semantic ranges. So ranges of options that of new incoming facts. But if you remember our discussion of the uh, law of epistemic distribution and omniscience, there was the following issue. So one of the axioms that's valid in um, uh, standard epistemic logic says that if you know that phi, and you know that if phi implies psi, so you know that the antecedent phi, and you know the conditional phi implies psi, then you will know that psi. And what that says is that your knowledge is closed under simple logical inferences like modus ponens. Right, because underneath the knowledge, you have a modus ponens inference, phi, phi implies psi leads to psi. And now uh, what's said is that if you know those two premises, so you know that phi, know that phi implies psi, you would also automatically know the conclusion psi. But if you iterate that, it would actually suggest that um, your knowledge is closed under any logical inference that you could make. And the question we raised uh, uh, last week was, um, if you think about real epistemic agents, is that a very realistic assumption? Probably not. Um, but now there's a sort of interesting challenge here or issue. Think of the standard notion of logical consequence. So um, what you learn in an introduction to logic is that this means the following, that uh, whenever the premises are true, the conclusion is true. So a valid logical consequence says that truth of the premises enforces truth of the conclusion. But if that is true, then in this dynamic perspective of last week, if I were to update with the premises, so if you were to get the information uh, that the premises give you, then a logically valid conclusion is already going to be true. So if you were to update with it, nothing should happen. So that's a sort of tension, because on the one hand, you would like to say that logical inferences can be informative, right? We may not be aware of certain logical consequences of what we know. But on the other hand, if you think in terms of how logical validity is defined, then actually you would say that uh, what's typical for logical validity is that it doesn't add any further information to the information that's already in the premises. That's precisely what validity says. So how can that be? How can logical inference be informative? This is a simple question. It's been raised by many authors, uh, including Hintika, the founding father of epistemic logic. And I don't think there's a consensus on an answer. So uh, my transitional topic is just to say a few things about it. After that, I'm going to shift my focus to the notion of logical consequence uh, per se. 
One way of thinking about what inference actually does, even a modus ponens inference, is as uh, saying, well, that, okay, maybe it doesn't increase semantic information in the sense of range that I talked about on Friday, but we could think of it as modifying a new, more fine-grade sort of information that we could think of as more syntactic. It has something to do with the form of these premises. So you have an implication, phi arrow psi. Then you have phi, so these two forms fit, right? The antecedent is actually the same form as uh, your second premise. And then you're allowed just at the formal or syntactic level to detach uh, the psi. So we could think of it as a sort of uh, information that has to do with manipulating syntax. Or if you don't want to be that close to the syntax, you could think of it as manipulating our awareness of useful propositions in syntax that describe our semantic information. But that's just a general answer. Um, if we want to make this more precise, we should provide an account of awareness or attention dynamics and how that actually works in epistemic scenarios. Um, <clears throat> I'll actually try to move. Yeah, this is actually easier. Um, and that is actually an area on which I don't think there are standard models. I just want to pose this question to you, uh, you know, invite uh, your thinking about it, and I'll tell a little bit about one way in which one could think about this. Let's again think about this distribution law for knowledge, which we had on Friday. So, okay, I've talked about it several times now. Um, the way you would normally read this law in epistemic logic is that there's a sort of automatic transition. If you know the premises of a modus ponens inference, then automatically, because it just says if you have that knowledge, then you also have the knowledge at sign. But in this more fine-grained setting, you'd rather think of the following sort of uh, principle. If you know the two premises, so you know that phi implies psi, and you know that phi, then provided that you perform some suitable action, you will actually also know that psi. So the act has to be a suitable epistemic action, and what that action might be, you could give various answers to. As I said, there's no standard answer. For instance, one answer might be that uh, you draw the inference, as we say, that's a sort of action verb, right? Drawing an inference. And maybe that makes you aware of the consequence sign. There can many, be many more such actions, and uh, you know, like I, I'm not aware of any sort of general theory of this, but as I said, let me just give you one model to show you one concrete way in which you could think about this. <laughs> So this goes back to work in the 1980s on uh, what was called awareness. So enrich worlds in our epistemic models with sets of formulas. So a world also comes with a set of formulas, and you can think of those as a sort of uh, propositions that you're aware of or that you're paying attention to. So lots of things could be true at a world, but the set of awareness formulas could be very small. Maybe you're only paying attention to a very small part of the propositions that are true at that world. And in the language, we put an operator A phi, and it has a very simple explanation. A phi holds at world S if the actual formula phi is in the awareness set at that world. Now, how could this awareness be modified? Well, again, in a sort of simplest example, you could think about adding formulas to the awareness set or deleting formulas from the awareness set, right? So you could pay attention to more things, plus phi would be the operation of now phi comes to my attention. So I put it in the awareness set, so that's now also available for me to think about explicitly. But of course, also over time, things disappear from the awareness set. So minus phi could say, uh, drop phi from the awareness set, no longer pay attention to it. And then the only thing I want to say is that you'll see some very simple laws in the same style that I gave you on Friday for other update operations, now having to do with manipulating awareness. For instance, uh, the first law says that if you add phi to the awareness set 
and you then know semantically that psi, that's the same as knowing beforehand that adding phi would give psi. The reason for that is that K is your implicit knowledge based on your semantic information. Your semantic information doesn't change by manipulating the awareness you have of it. It's the same range of worlds. And uh, that actually shows in this uh, principle of interchange. And the second principle also very, very simple. Um, suppose that after adding phi, uh, you're actually aware of psi. Well, that can only be true in one of two cases. Um, it's either the case that you were already aware of psi before, right? Or the phi that you've added is actually literally the formula psi that you're talking about. So this is a sort of bookkeeping action. Okay. Now, that logic is very, very simple, and uh, I'm not recommending it as a very interesting logic, but it's just to give you a concrete example of how you could think about attention or awareness uh, dynamics and what it does. It becomes a bit in more interesting if you now combine this with the semantic knowledge that we had last week. So let me define a stronger notion of knowledge, k plus phi, as the conjunction of k phi and a phi. So you could think of this as a sort of explicit knowledge. And what it says is you have explicit knowledge if you have implicit semantic knowledge that phi is the case. So that's in the same style as last week. And also phi is in your awareness set. So phi is one of the propositions you're paying attention to. Incidentally, this is just one definition you could give for explicit knowledge. Uh, but uh, again, I'm just after giving you some examples. Now we can amend epistemic distributions for explicit knowledge. So what's not valid would be, with K plus defined in this style, uh, the, the version which the first version I'll give you here. If you, you explicitly know if phi then psi, and you explicitly know that phi, then automatically you explicitly know that psi. Why is that not valid? Well, the semantic information part is okay, like last week. But the point is that you might be aware of the implication phi then psi. You might be aware of phi, but maybe you're not aware or paying attention to psi. So that's why the consequence could still be false. But what's valid is something in the format I gave you further uh, before. Uh, in terms of an action. If you explicitly know that phi implies psi, and you explicitly know that phi, then after putting, oh, and I'm so sorry, this is a um, typo. I said plus phi, but it should be plus psi. I, I don't have something to write it, but the, so the blue action plus phi should be plus psi. If you then explicitly become aware of psi, then indeed you explicitly know that psi. So uh, with that um, uh, the modification, uh, I'll make a note that I should change this in the uh, <coughs> version to be posted. So this is one way you could think about uh, what awareness dynamics is doing on top of semantic information and what inferences are doing. Um, if you draw an inference, you do something which is semantically valid but you're also paying attention or you're beginning to pay attention to the conclusion. That means that the conclusion as a statement enters the awareness or attention set. And it's that dynamics together with the semantic information dynamics, which um, describes this process of knowledge gain. Uh, this is not just in this particular setting. Uh, if you do this, you can also make other interesting distinctions. For instance, uh, an important operation last week was this exclamation mark phi, which actually said that you're getting the true information that phi is the case. Now, if you think about that, and if you go back to the earlier lit literature, like in the work of Barwise and Perry in the 1980s, uh, you will actually see that they made a distinction between, think of this update as sort of seeing. They made a distinction between two kinds of seeing. One kind of seeing is implicit. So you see something that's true, but you may not be aware of exactly what it is that you're seeing. The other sort of seeing, they call seeing that, is explicit seeing. 
So you see something and it's also clear to you that that's what you're seeing. Like in a simple example in natural language syntax, if you say Mary saw John come, um, that could just mean that she actually saw a person coming in, but she didn't realize that it was John. So actually John was coming. Mary saw that, so she had a certain connection, observational connection to that event. But maybe she wasn't aware of the fact that it was John. And that's versus another construction in natural language, namely Mary saw that John came, for instance. That act does suggest saw that same meaning before in the implicit. Also aware that it was a so that's explicit seeing. One way of thinking is again apparatus. I'm uh, here. The updates of love semantically as a um, uh, the range of world be aware of us and find that in some way the lines are just something that you'd have nation uh, combine that sort of up with an attention so moving fight you get more seeing that this imp uh, uh, contrast taking up steam again be taken much further. So this whole topic. It's a very simple is uh, if you really what inference in, in get extending knowledge. Uh, my simple view so far go a certain way, but probably we need something much more drastic and, and interesting, like uh, you may have to join model theory or proof theory. Um, it may also have to do with thinking more computationally about how agents op operate. And since the awareness is or attention is generally limited, you might even have to turn to cognitive psychology and think of agents with bounded resources. This is just about this. I think this is and uh, definitely one uh, on which there's no settled view or settled model. I'm going to skip this. Okay, this was transitional because you could start amendment I gave last week. But now I want to become a bit more drastic. So if you think about inference, then in the background, there is these are steps you can make. And, and they're going to be valid as long as they stay in line with your notion of logical validity, right? So good inferences terms where you have, you draw a conclusion and it's valid if this is in accordance with your underlying notion of logical consequence. Now, so far in, uh, uh, I've assumed that the notion of logical consequence is the standard logical one. So, the analysis I did assumed that that knowledge of the other things on, but more deeply, I say a logical consequence. So that's and it's my main. So here's two logic and epistemology. Lecture one. Existing class enriched with knowledge more study the nature of uh, approach, not and not as you could say, so to speak. today's lecture. I want to use logic, incorporate knowledge from the inside. How could that work? And by the way, a, a, a talk about these two viewpoints. So, very, and uh, well, uh, of course, when logic started, realizing that there are certain inference, 
and valid intuitively. So valid pattern, P and Q, conclude an invalid if P then Q, therefore you don't many people's favorite fallacy. In other words, we're talking in my two examples, or generally that could, and they go to a C. And the question is, what is the link? When are we going to call a conclusion valid? What's the basis for our judgments that actually say that the first pattern is invalid and the second one is valid? No, that's answered in your logic textbooks if you take a first uh, course in logic. And here's the standard notion of logical consequence you can find in textbooks. If the premises are true, so is the conclusion. Yeah, it's that simple. So whenever the premises are true, it's the conclusion. See that if you check two inferences with truth tables in propositional logic, you will see exactly how that works. Now, what's defensible is that in the early history of logic, uh, this wasn't so clear, and that there were also epistemic views. So that the point of logical inference would actually be more epistemic, and what they would do is actually take you from knowledge of the premises to knowledge of the conclusion. So, uh, logical validity would be exactly that which can automatically take knowledge. I'm not saying that, uh, of course, Aristotle truth, but to knowledge is definitely a logical consequence, which has been around. And this is not a small matter because it's actually an interesting issue. If you have a knowledge to knowledge view of logical validity, then logic is by definition a part of epistemology. Because by exploring what are the logically valid inferences, you actually explore basic properties of knowledge. Notice that this is different in a in, in, in way from what I did last week, because if you do it this, last week, as I said, I assumed logic the way it is and used that to analyze knowledge. But if I set up things this way, then actually, uh, I need prior intuitions about knowledge in order to set up our understanding of logics. So our understanding of logic depends on our understanding of knowledge, not the other way around. However, the modern logical view is, you might call, truth to truth. So if the premises are true, then the conclusion is true. This, of course, decouples the logical laws from epistemic subjects. They would also hold if there were no epistemic subjects at all, if there was no knowledge at all. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean that truth to truth has nothing to do with uh, knowledge, because as we saw in the first lecture, we can still describe epistemic uh, agents from a sort of outside observer's perspective, talking about what's true about these knowing agents. So it's not that truth to truth totally cuts the link with epistemology, but the epistemology is no longer deeply involved in understanding what the logic is. Small aside, I think I'm going to skip this, but if you read some articles in the Handbook of Logical Thought in China, for instance, the one on uh, uh, Buddhist logic in Tibet, then uh, in this handbook, which is going to come out soon, you'll actually see how knowledge to knowledge and truth to truth views played in Tibetan uh, ideas about Buddhist logic uh, with actually knowledge to knowledge first and truth to truth coming late. Now, <clears throat> this I've already said, the modern logical view of uh, logical consequence is truth to truth. So that's what you find with Bolzano and with Tarski. Okay. As a small aside, of course, I say truth to truth, but that immediately implies that um, uh, there's also something about falsity to falsity, right? Say, um, if the conclusion is false, then at least one of the premises must be false. And that, of course, also corresponds to an important role of logical inference, namely, it aids refutation, right? If you can derive false conclusions, from something, then you can conclude that something must be false about what you assumed. 
So that's of course important in the epistemology of Karl Popper and other refutation oriented um, philosophers. Now, of course, there were reasons for making the truth to truth move, which I won't go into. It's uh, sort of interesting to read Frege and what Frege says about Kant uh, from this point of view. But it's true that um, uh, this separated, now logic uh, started having its independent intuitions based on truth. Well, then in my first lecture, I show that uh, the area is reconnected again, but I don't have to go through this slide in detail. Um, you can then take logic in the truth-based view. Uh, and in the 1960s, people did start returning to knowledge, but now describing it in a very different style. So the knowledge was not involved in understanding logical consequence. The, logic, the knowledge was described by new epistemic operators that were studied in a sort of truth-based logical apparatus. So that was the framework of our first conversation on Friday. Now, before I'm going to say more about knowledge to knowledge, uh, it may be a small technical digression. I can distinguish truth to truth views of consequence from knowledge to knowledge views, but is there actually a difference, right? You know, this English expression, uh, uh, does the distinction correspond to a difference? Friesen, suppose that you're in the epistemic logic of Friday, compare two notions of consequence. One is that phi implies psi in the truth-based sense, so whenever phi is true, psi is true. And the other one is in terms of knowledge. So if you know that phi, then you know that psi. So you could ask yourself, well, maybe I can see a sort of diff feel a sort of difference here. The, the, the one to the left, more truth-based, and the one to the right puts knowledge in the picture. But maybe it's equivalent, maybe it amounts to the same thing when you actually look at formulas phi and psi. Now, let's distinguish two directions here. Uh, the direction from phi implies psi to k phi in, uh, implies k psi indeed follows by distribution, and it follows for all formulas phi and psi. Because uh, if you have that logical, well, I'm not going to do that in detail, but if you know a little bit about epistemic logic, you will know that this implication is actually valid. Okay. So the truth based view would imply the knowledge-based view in this particular setting. What about the other direction? Suppose that you know that knowledge of phi implies knowledge of psi. Does it follow that in the truth sense, phi, the truth of phi implies psi? It's actually easy to see that this must be correct for non-epistemic formulas phi and psi. That means formulas that just describe base facts, but which don't themselves have epistemic operators. Because how could you see that? Well, assume that k phi implies k psi. And now just assume that you're somewhere in a world, S, where phi is true. Remember, this phi has no epistemic operator, so you can just think of it as a propositional formula. So that S could just be thought as a valuation for propositional logic. Now take the epistemic model, which just has S as its range, then k phi is also true at s, given the fact that our knowledge was explained as what's true everywhere in the range. Therefore, by assumption, k psi is true at s, and therefore psi. Okay, this is a small technical excursion, but in any case, it's correct for non-epistemic formulas. But the two notions come apart if we I also allow for epistemic assertions. This was a point in lecture one that Often, in terms of information that you can get, non-ground fact, epistemic information makes sense. It makes sense for me to answer your question by saying, I don't know. That can be very informative for you. Or it makes sense for, you, for me to communicate to you that John knows whether Mary knows. This is all information not about ground facts, which that knowledge is about. It's information about presence of knowledge or absence of knowledge. And if we do this, then we actually get counter, can get counterexamples from this implication of knowledge to knowledge to truth to truth. I'm going to leave you to think about example A with my posted slides. I'm not going to go through that here. 
but um, that's one counter example but maybe the simplest sort of uh, way of seeing that this implication would be fishy is um a, a b so in the at least in the standard epistemic logic we have positive introspection so k phi implies kk uh, did i say ah, sorry another typo i'm so sorry about that um if you look at the last line after B, what it actually says is that K phi implies KK psi. That should be K phi implies KK phi, because that's the introspection. So B should start with K phi implies KK phi. Now, if I had the implication that I'm actually looking at, then this should imply that phi, uh, that K phi follows from phi. Where notice now, of course, I use the formula k phi, which is epistemic. But of course, this is going to be very rarely valid, because that's a very strong assertion that if you have phi true, you actually know it. So from that, you can already see that, um, uh, generally speaking, the implication from epistemized consequence to truth-based consequence is not going to hold. Okay. So that was just a bit more of a technical episode, but you see, it's one thing for me to make these distinctions like knowledge to knowledge and truth to truth. But it's another thing to think a bit more deeply about uh, how they are related and, and to which extent there is a real difference between the two styles of thinking about logical consequence. But <clears throat> I want to make one more step. Because you might think that my whole discussion so far was not yet radical enough. Because in what I did here, when I think about the interpretation of the formulas phi and psi that I'm talking about here, at least those formulas phi and psi themselves are in still interpreted in terms of standard semantics, and the standard semantics works in terms of truth. So we're comparing classical and epistemized consequence for a language whose basic non-epistemic part is still interpreted in standard truth-based semantics. Now, the full force of epistemizing logic deploys only when we also change the interpretation of the logical constants. So not just the notion of consequence, but also how we actually think of interpreting the logical formulas. So more on that below. This is also just something I'm throwing out for you to think about. Um, I've distinguished truth to truth views from of, for logical consequence with knowledge to knowledge views. But of course, instead of knowledge, you could also put other epistemic attitudes. We could also have a sort of belief to belief view of logical consequence where we say uh, uh, something is valid if it will always lead you, if on the basis of your current beliefs, to also believe in the conclusion. Now, I skipped the topic of belief, and this is actually interesting because you might think that this is closer to a, another tradition which historically was very close to logic, namely the tradition of dialectic. And um, a, a, because dialectic was more about uh, influencing people's beliefs. And of course, these things were not at odds because if you, you know, in a medieval university, you would be taught the trivium, which is logic, dialectic, and rhetoric. Okay, so these things were not enemies, but they were sort of natural companions to study. Well, we skipped the topic of belief in lecture one. I also do that here. Um, so this slide is just as a sort of teaser for those of you who want to think about other things to put instead of knowledge to knowledge, like belief to belief. Okay. Now, what I want to say is that uh, as knowledge to knowledge views, then there's the truth to truth view of uh, logical consequence, like in the work of Bolzano, Tarski, Frege. But in the 20th century, quickly, other views started coming along as well, which actually go a bit back to this idea of ep epistemization. Here's one new entanglement of logic and knowledge, which started in the early 20th century namely constructive logics in the foundations of mathematics. In the work of Brouwer and other constructivists, the notion of truth 
wasn't considered that essential for uh, uh, understanding mathematics. The essential notion was proof. So if then logic is supposed to describe the mathematical activity, then what we actually want is proof to proof accounts of, if, well, both the logical constants and of validity. Because logical consequence is now rather about proving implications, but it's all about proof. So in the 1920s, uh, the first explanations appear, appeared for the logical constants in terms of proof. So I'm just giving you very high level, uh, two clauses from the famous BHK interpretation, Brouwer, Heit, and Kolmogorov. So what's the explanation of a conjunction A and B? So now we're no longer talking about A and B is true, if and only if A is true and B is true, the standard truth-based semantic clause. No, we have to explain what's a proof for A and B. And the answer is, a proof for A and B is a pair of two proofs, a proof for A and a proof for B. Okay. What's a proof of an implication? Well, that's, uh, you know, like I said, logical consequences about proving implications. But that's even a more complex notion. So basically, it's definitely not something in terms of truth, like a truth table in propositional logic or something like that. It's rather a method which will transform any given proof of A into a proof of B. So implications actually become very powerful things. They're methods for tra proof transformation, transformation of proofs for antecedents into proofs for consequence. And there's further clauses in this understanding. But notice that what's happening here is that the truth-based semantic understanding of the logical notions is replaced by proof-based. Okay. The result of this, as we'll see in a moment, is no longer classical logic, but intuitionistic logic or variants thereof. And the differences between these two logics actually reflect epistemic features. So I'll continue with that theme. Now, the proof-based view is, of course, just in the foundations of mathematics. But um, actually, if you look at the recent literature in um, uh, uh, well, especially philosophical logic, um, you'll actually see that there's many further notions of logical consequence that often use something, a notion that you could think of as lying a bit in between knowledge and truth, namely information. Information sounds a bit more objective, uh, less agent-oriented than knowledge. On the other hand, it's more loaded and, and maybe, uh, yeah, uh, intentional than just the notion of truth. And many logical systems since the 1980s base their account of logical consequence on what you might call information states and, uh, well, in the background, information flow. And roughly speaking, the sort of schema which in these logics you get for the notion of logical consequence is this. All information that supports, or some similar notion which the author likes of, of such an article, um, all information that supports the premises also supports the conclusion. So now truth or knowledge has been replaced by support. And we're no longer talk, talking about what's true, let's say, in the world or in some reality, but we're talking about what's supported by information, say, an information state. So many logics uh, fall under this heading. I, I mentioned a few on my slides. And of course, there's also many varieties of implementing these ideas, which I won't get into. But so this is a move you can see in a lot of literature. Now, I would claim that this move to information states is still pretty epistemic, because uh, the fact that knowledge and information are closely related is a persistent shared theme in epistemology and logic. The epistemic logics of lecture one involved semantic information, so there you had a very strong connection. Something I didn't discuss in lecture one, but could have, is that in many epistemological views, knowledge is seen as a form of stable belief under new information. So again, information is important then in uh, explaining the behavior of knowledge. 
And there's even very different links of knowledge to information. Uh, for instance, in the work of uh, Fred Dretzky, this is the second, the later Dretzky, not the Dretzky of relevant alternative theory, who wrote this famous book, Knowledge and the Flow of Information, where basically uh, he connected knowledge to information and informational dependence in the sense of Shannon's uh, information theory. So the move to information to me is still an epistemic move uh, even though it doesn't go exactly to the notion of knowledge. Now, these are general statements. So, uh, so I'll just discuss one case today of an epistemized semantics, where we actually put knowledge into the heart of understanding of what the logical system is. And I'll take the case of intuitionistic logic. So I already said uh, it has its motivation in constructive mathematics. Truth is replaced by what is settled by proof or knowledge. And uh, various famous philosophers have actually suggested that intuitionistic style understanding of um, logic fit very well with um, verificationist views of meaning, so that they also have a much broader philosophical significance. So what we do in this case is very different from what I did on Friday. I will just take the standard propositional language. I won't introduce K operators that discuss knowledge explicitly. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a new constructive interpretation of the logical operations. And I already said that would be in terms of information states that support or do something else to propositions. And now the question is, can we make this work in terms of, let's say, the logical sentence structure, the way you're used to in logic? Because even when you change your idea about what the basis of logic is, so truth or support, most people would still like to hang on to the style of analysis that you find in logic, which on the whole is a sort of compositional explanation of meanings in terms of sentence structure. Well, for that, we need two things. One is that we need a sort of information models where <clears throat> in line with the ideas I gave before. Um, so we have points or worlds that can be viewed as stages or states of inquiry or alternative, if you wish, as pieces of information. But let, let's just say information states. And in those order, in those models, there's an ordering. And the ordering comes from what's called an accessibility relation, which you could think of as standing for, as you go from left to right, you learn more. So it's about temporal progression of inquiry, or if you were to think of information, information inclusion. I'm talking, of course, for those of you who know, about the models that were famously introduced by Saul Kripke in the early 1960s for intuitionistic logic. They have a longer history, but I won't go into that here. And of course, in these models, uh, this slide will also remind you of something that I talked about on Friday, because actually these models also look very much, and in fact they are, uh, models for the epistemic logic S4, which I discussed back then, which also had this sort of temporal uh, interpretation. Okay, so those are the models. So just very easy to visualize, say information states from left to right, they can go richer. If you have a fork like this, it means that the process of inquiry could go in one of two ways. If you're on the left and you're looking at what might happen, you might actually go up and learn that P is the case, but you might actually also go down and uh, not have P at all. Okay. Because, of course, in the process of inquiry, you don't know exactly where you're going to go, what you're going to learn, but you may see the possibilities. So here is an information-based semantics for propositional logic language, the way it would work in Kripke's version of intuitionism. So phi and psi, the conjunction, is just read as an ordinary conjunction. And this fits with this idea that um, if S supports phi and psi, it supports both. There's alternatives for this in modern truth maker semantics and so on, but I'm not going to go there. I want to just give you a simple example of uh, how these ideas work in this simple case. Um, what about disjunction? Well, actually, um, 
in intuitionism, uh, the thinking is that um, disjunctions actually get a very strong uh, meaning. So uh, you can only support a disjunction if you actually support one of the two disjuncts. This is in line with the proof interpretation, because uh, in the constructivism, a proof for a phi or psi actually is a proof for phi or a proof for psi. So a proof for phi or psi has to decide. Do I, am I a proof for phi or am I a proof for psi? That's reflected in this second clause. Then, what about negation? Well, negation is read very strongly here. So supporting a negation, if I thought classically, I would just think that S supports not phi if S doesn't support phi. Well, that's very weak. That just means that currently there's an absence of phi. But supporting the negation, again, think of my epistemic interpretation, has to mean something like, I know it. Right, right now, I already know that not phi. And the explanation for that is that there is no further or later information states, T, where I'm going to get phi. So negation is read as a sort of refutation. Right. The, the, the negation not phi is supported right now if when you look at the further process of inquiry, you're never going to get phi. You can rule it out. And then this is in the semantic setting, uh, sort of closest equivalent of the earlier clause I gave you in the proof theoretic account. Uh, phi then psi in this semantics is actually going to mean also something stronger than what you might expect in classical logic, where it would just say either phi is false or both phi and psi are true. What it's going to say is that if I look at my process of inquiry, so I look anywhere upward from S to all the possible stages where I could get, then what I see is that whenever I actually do get to phi, so I get to a stage where phi would be supported, then actually psi would also be supported. Okay. So that's an example of support semantics. So notice that this thinking is very different from thinking in terms of truth. That also leads to clauses that look different from classical understandings, like for negation and implication. And maybe as a small technical feature, um, uh, given this interpretation of support as a sort of knowledge, what you would actually expect is that if you know at this stage that something is the case, then that can't be changed in the further process of inquiry. So that's the notion of persistence. So what you assume in the semantics is that if you are at proposition letters and um, a certain stage makes P true, that any later stage will also make P true. But this also holds for all complex formulas. So the implication of that would be the way this semantics works out is that once phi is true, which really means it's supported, your current information forces it, then there's no way it could later be unforced. At all later stages, you're still going to have it. So I hope this gives you a more concrete idea of how an epistemized semantics would look like. And the intuitionistic semantics from by Kripke in the 60s is still one of the most telling examples. If you understand this, you'll understand a lot about more elaborate systems in the current literature. Now, as a result of this, uh, we have a very different explanation now, epistemized, right? It's a sort of support, knowledge-based of the, the propositional language, and that is going to show in differences between what's valid in intuitionistic logic versus classical logic. For instance, famously, um, here's a law that's valid in classical logic, excluded middle, so A or not A. But that's typically not valid in intuitionistic semantics. On the proof interpretation, that's totally obvious because a proof for A or not A would have to be a proof of either A or a proof of not A. But that means that you would have to be able to decide which of the two is actually provable. And it's, it's unclear that that's the case. But in the semantics, you, you could also see very simple counterexamples. Suppose, for instance, just to illustrate how this semantic works, I, I just give the simplest example. Suppose that you have a model which has two stages. So in stage one, there's nothing which you have yet. 
but you could go to stage two where actually a has become true think of a as a proposition letter then what could you say at one you don't have a because by assumption in my model a isn't there yet at one it will only come at two but do you have not a no because not a at one would require absence of a at all further stages but a is actually present at two so in this model at stage one neither the, the disjunction a or not a is not true so it's excluded middle has been refuted but with a little bit more technical complication you can see that this same example also refutes another standard logical law for negation namely the double negation law you can show that in this model if you look at world number one not not a is true okay i'm not going to unpack for you what that means uh, remember that the clause for negation uh, talks about for no t greater than or equal to s so you'd have to think about what two negations do when you on top of each other when you unpack them but in any case when you do you're actually going to see that not not a is actually going to be true at stage one in this model but a isn't and i'll drop the last example so is some so this the information slash knowledge based view which is embodied in intuitionism is actually going to lead to differences in validity with what classical logic thinks is valid that's significant so now we have truth-based classical logic propositional logic so just think about propositional logic we have knowledge-based uh, uh, variants like intuitionistic logic how do they compare well ever since the 1920s and 30s uh, there has been a, a long history of comparing and relating the two logical systems and we know a lot for instance all intuitionistic validities are classically valid so um i'm not going to show that but I'll just take that for a fact so um, the epistemized view actually doesn't lead to logical principles that you wouldn't endorse classically speaking so a lot of common ground remains but then there's also absence of classical law so the the intuitionistic set of validity is actually smaller and that's of course interesting because that means that uh, there's information in the absence and that information has to do with the epistemic interpretation of my logical operations so in some sense the absence uh, reflects epistemic facts for instance uh, maybe yeah so for instance a or not a um, if you were to read that epistemically what it actually says is that i can decide whether a is true or whether a can be refuted so it really has a sort of flavor of i either know that a right now or i know that not a well that's of course not a valid principle because if that were valid i would be collapsing knowledge and truth so the absence of this law actually tells me something about the difference between knowledge and truth so that's uh, the same sort of analysis can be given to many failures this is actually sort of interesting you could also say in a more literary sense so most people think that when you have a logical system that the information is in the laws of the system the laws that you are actually explicitly put but if you think about ordinary conversation then actually when you listen to somebody who's saying certain things there's information of two kinds there's information in what this person says and there's information in what this person doesn't say right say you've given a talk and somebody talks to you about who was present and so on and says a lot of things and then you notice that this person actually in that whole conversation doesn't mention the content of your talk what you could probably conclude from that was that he didn't like it very much okay so in the absence there's inf in the presence there's information that like you get information about who was attending but in the absence of commentary on, of your talk there may also be information about what a person really thought about your talk okay and the same is true in logical systems absence of laws 
can be informative. The fact that they're not endorsed tells you something about how the logic thinks about meaning. Finally, um, there's well-known translations between classical and intuitionistic logic. That's more for mathematical logic, but it's, at least from a technical point of view, the logics look different, but they have lots of interconnections. Okay. So now you've seen intuitionistic logic as an example of an epistemized version of propositional logic, where we've now built into the very understanding of our logical notions, the notions of support, information, and I would say knowledge. Okay, if you compare that with the epistemic logics of Friday, does that mean that the earlier philosophical criticisms that I mentioned on Friday of standard epistemic logic go away? Well, some earlier criticisms that I mentioned on Friday don't return as they are just because the language of propositional logic has no K operators. So, for instance, I can't say which introspection principles uh, intuitionistic propositional logic assumes because to formulate introspection principles, I would need a K operator, which I don't have. Right? I just have the language of propositional logic. Nevertheless, uh, it's interesting to think about where I may be in some other ways uh, introspection has been built into the intuitionistic semantics. I would personally think that the semantic persistence, which I mentioned before, is a sort of substitute for positive introspection. However, a typical issue that does return, whether you do it in the style of Friday or now in this internally epistemized view of propositional logic are omniscience problems. If we think of agents that actually handle the information, then it seems unlikely that they know all things that follow in intuitionistic logic. It's just as unlikely as that they would know that uh, in terms of classical logic, uh, like we saw on Friday. So I think omniscience problems are actually neutral between um, uh, the epistemic logic view of Friday and the internalized uh, intuitionistic view, let me say, that I'm presenting to you now, uh, omniscience is a sort of issue in both cases. So solutions to omniscience, like the one I discussed in terms of inference dynamics, uh, might actually apply to both. I'm going to skip this aside. So where am I now? I, uh, I <coughs> I'll summarize what, where I am, and then I'll say something about my last uh, topic. So what I've suggested is that there's two ways of bringing knowledge to the attention of uh, in the scope of logical analysis. One is, like on Friday, um, we take logic the way it is, so it's truth-based. We introduce operators for um, uh, knowledge or belief or other epistemic notions. And on the basis of our classical logical apparatus, we analyze how these operators of knowledge and belief behave. Okay. And that language is explicit in the way that uh, I can talk about John knows, that Mary knows, and so on. I can make lo lots of assertions about knowledge and belief. Then the other way that I've now presented does something actually much closer to the heart of logic. Because what it says is, uh, let's drop this emphasis on truth and let's think in terms of knowledge or information. But as I said, I think that's closely related. Okay, so then intuitionistic logic, I'm not saying that's the only way of doing it, not at all, right? There's an enormous number of information-based semantics in the current literature, but uh, <clears throat> it's a simple example for studying what happens then. So now you can leave the logical language the way it is, it's just the language of propositional logic. But in your understanding of what your basic logical operations mean, like conjunction, disjunction, negation, implication, you build in epistemic elements. And in your semantics, uh, your models are gonna look different like the models that I gave here or uh, described here. So um, the models of information states ordered in some sort of process of possible further growth or, or further 
uh, learning further things. So at each stage, you know certain things. Uh, as you go to the future, you might learn new things. So that's what I've done then. And um, <clears throat> so what you see then is that viewed in this way, intuitionistic logic is also a sort of analysis of knowledge, but not because it talks about knowledge explicitly, but because what it says about what's valid for your standard logical notions, that actually encodes epistemic facts. And I even made this a bit more subtle by saying that both the validities it has in propositional logic, they give information about knowledge, but also the fact that certain things are not valid tell you something about the intuitionistic view of knowledge. That's what I try to convey. So then my last topic is a little bit of reflection on the, the, these two styles of logic design, and you could also say two styles of studying knowledge. Okay. So that's my last topic for today. So once again, I've already said this, but I'll read it once more. Um, uh, the epistemic logics of our first lecture had explicit vocabulary for knowledge and other epistemic notions. The underlying propositional logic was classical, truth-based. Intuitionistic logic only has the classical logical vocabulary. It has no knowledge operators or other epistemic notions, but the meaning has now become epistemic, like in the semantics which I gave. The underlying propositional logic is non-classical support-based. Absence of classical laws can give epistemic information. What are we to make of these different stances, you might say? So if we were to compare the epistemic logic of Friday in Hintika style with intuitionistic logic as two ways of uh, bringing knowledge into logic. Um, yeah. Let me first say that um, this is not just a small uh, thing for this particular case. So actually, uh, these two stances occur actually in lots of places in logic. It's much more general than intuition is versus epistemic. So basically, if you want to design a logical system for studying uh, a notion, and you look at the literature, you see two very general methods, especially in the area of philosophical logic. One method is that you add explicit vocabulary to a classical language. So basically what you get is a classical logic with an extended set of modal operators. And that notion you want to study, it could be knowledge, it could be proof, but it could be anything. Maybe you want to talk about the logic of desire, or you want to talk about the ontic logic and what you should be doing. Okay, um, uh, method one uh, would give you standard deontic logic, where you have classical propositional logic, but on top of that, uh, you have the deontic operators. Method two, on the, where intuition is, is one example, intuitionistic semantics, reinterpret the basic logical consequence, constants in terms of the notion that you're interested in. Then generally speaking, you will get a non-classical logic and there's implicit information because you don't have explicit operators in an in intuitionistic case for knowledge. So uh, to some extent, what you're learning about knowledge is implicit. If you look at the literature, you can easily determine, uh, you know, which of the two methods uh, an author is following, whether you read an older paper in philosophical logic or a uh, more recent paper. I'm not saying that these two methods are always available. For instance, uh, to, just to take an example, uh, I've sometimes wondered with deontic logic, suppose that you wanted to have method two for deontic logic, then in your language, you shouldn't have operators like all and so on, but you should somehow explain basic propositional logic in terms of obligations and permissions. And I'm not aware of, of ways of doing that. Might actually be interesting challenging. Um, okay, we could now start a discussion about which approach is better. So Friday's epistemic logic or today's intuitionistic logic, or if you wish, the explicit approach versus the implicit approach. 
But at least from a logician's point of view, that will be a rather futile discussion. And here, the first technical fact that's important here is that um, systems developed in these two ways are often intertranslatable. And, and I'll make that a bit more precise on the next slide. But what I mean by that is, um, if you understand intuitionistic logic, you can, from the standpoint of intuitionistic logic, also understand what the classical logician is saying if you translate the classical language into the intuitionistic language in the right way. And it's also true vice versa, that if you're a classical logician, you can also understand what an intuitionistic logic, logician is up to, again, provided that you translate the intuitionistic language in some appropriate way into your classical language. And there's a whole theory about this with lots of translations, but I'll just mention one famous historical example, uh, the Gödel translation, which Gödel gave in the early 1930s. And it relies on the fact that truth-based and information-based models are the same as abstract mathematical entities. So when you look at models like this one here, of course, I said this is now an information model, right? Because that's how I was thinking of it. But notice that purely abstractly, the only thing we're looking at here is some sort of structure with three points and two arrows and some information about P. And as an abstract mathematical structure, it's exactly the same as the sort of structures, as you see at the bottom of this slide, that I would be using for epistemic S4 in the explicit mode where I have K operators. So this is a general point about semantics. The models that we often use for in method one and in method two are the same then you view them as abstract mathematical entities. But then, what do I mean when I say that on one slide they are information models, and on another slide they're sort of models for some standard modal logic? Well, that's about the intuitive interpretation of these abstract mathematical entities, which to a large extent is in the eye of the beholder. So it's what's sometimes called interpreted semantics. And the interpretation of the models, that's up to you. And you could make that different. Like say, you could think of them, the same structures informationally, or maybe more truth oriented. But there's still this underlying abstract mathematical substratum. The same point applies to all the uh, no, uh, proposed models in the current philosophical literature, but let me not go there. So here is the famous Gödel translation. Um, so it's based on the fact that the abstract models for intuitionistic logic that I gave you look very much like that, those which I already gave on Friday for modal S4. So here's the Gödel translation, and I apologize for the box notation. Think of the box as a K. What the Gödel translation does is um, it takes the language of propositional logic, but it's, it works as follows. The proposition letter P is replaced by... Here it says box P, but read that as uh, you know that P. This has to do with the fact that we treat proposition letters as being supported and persistent. So um, in our uh, intuitionistic semantics. So when you have P, it's going to stay P further on. So that's actually expressed from a modal point of view by the box P. And goes to and or goes to or. Uh, <clears throat> and if you have an implication, you strengthen that modally. So you say, well, that actually is, is um, box, or you know that phi implies psi. And on the standard semantics of knowledge, that means that for all further states, um, if you have phi, you have psi. And the same for not phi. Notice, yeah, okay. Well, here's a theorem that Gödel proved at the time. So um, uh, propositional uh, formula phi is provable in intuitionistic logic, if and only if the Gödel translation of phi is provable in S4. So this is a precise result. It says that the provability or validity notion 
of intuitionistic knowledge-based semantics can actually be understood in the explicit style epistemic logic S4 if you actually translate intuitionistic assertions according to the Gödel translation. And what the Gödel translation really does is it looks at this semantics here and basically what it does is and you'll see that most clearly with the, the third and fourth clauses it actually notes that for instance when you have a negation not phi what you see there then is a truth condition which you would also have in the modal logic of the friday lecture because basically it says for all t greater than or equal to s that's a k operator you don't have phi well that's exactly what that clause in the translation says the intuitionistic not phi goes to box not phi box is your k operator and now um, so in other words uh, if you look at these models if you look at the support based semantics it may still well be possible like Gödel did actually not based on this semantics but uh, he had another intuition <laughs> Um, to actually relate these logics very strongly. Okay. This is just one instance of a web of translations between various uh, systems, in, uh, implicit and explicit. Um, uh, some of these translations can be very hard to find. For instance, Gödel uh, it, it translated intuitionistic validity into classical S4. Uh, epistemic uh, uh, validity. That's it. So you could think, okay, that's good for the explicit S4 view because it can actually understand what intuitionism is doing in its own terms, provided that you do the translation. But maybe intuitionistic logic cannot understand what S4 is doing in its own terms under translation. But that was an open problem. In fact, many people, including myself, thought that the situation was like that, that actually uh, the explicit S4 system could interpret on the translation uh, the implicit intuitionistic view of uh, logical validity and consequence, but not vice versa. But this turned out to be false. So a Stanford student, uh, David Fernandez Duque, actually provide a converse embedding or translation from S4 into IL. Uh, that's, uh, I believe, around 2005. Uh, very surprising. So um, there's lots of, so that's, Gödel did his results in the early 30s. He did it in the early 2000s. So then we're talking about a time lag of 70 years uh, before uh, the reverse connection was actually realized. Of course, translations are technical results. So there's still questions to ponder. Suppose that we think of S4 which was Hintika's original epistemic logic with knowledge operators and explicit style based on classical logic. We have intuitionistic logic, implicit, no K operators, but it's a non-classical logic with an epistemic interpretation right from the start. We can translate them both ways. Does that mean that they're the same logic so that there's no difference between the implicit and explicit version of the system? I leave that to you. That's actually a question for philosophers of logic. Um, I think many logicians would actually say, no, it is a tight connection, but there's still sort of intentional differences between the two systems. So more generally speaking, uh, what do translations or mutual translations tell us? But in any case, uh, here's the beginnings of a program. As I said, intuitionistic logic is only one example of an epistemized version of propositional logic where you've put the knowledge information internally into your understanding of what the logic is. There's many more such logics in the current literature, information based, knowledge based and so on. On the other hand, these logics often have explicit counterparts where the logic stays countable, sorry, classical and where you have all these additional modalities. So what's the general picture? Can we systematically intertranslate implicit and explicit approaches to epistemic structure and logic? I don't know. I think that's a large and uh, extremely interesting question. 
Well, for more on the contrast that I've tried to explain here, uh, here's a paper from the Journal of uh, Philosophical Logic, which uh, appeared in 2018. It, it talks in a lot more detail about these two stances, and it also gives many further translations, for instance, between truth maker logics and classical modal logics. So illustrating my general ideas, which I only gave you for intuitionism and epistemic as for logic uh, in other settings. So the upshot for our two lectures. I would say that logic and epistemology connect in two ways. One way is more explicit and classical epistemic logic is the paradigm for that. So, um, and that's also the style of many well-known logics in the area of philosophical logic. But we could also do it more implicitly by putting the knowledge into the understanding, uh, letting knowledge or information replace truth so, in other words, letting the epistemology enter our very understanding of what the logical language means and what logical validity is. Intuitionistic logic is an example of that and many other logics. The two approaches offer their own unique features. As you will have seen, the style or atmosphere of my presentation on Friday is very different from my presentation today. I'm not going to go into what these features are, but uh, you know, look at examples and you'll see it. Nevertheless, these approaches, though they may feel and look different, they are related, often even intertranslatable. So perhaps the best I can say for now is that if we want to understand interfaces of logic and epistemology, we should pursue both styles of logical analysis and keep connecting them. And um, that's my conclusion for this part. So I've actually added more conversation topics to what we had on Friday. Uh, I've talked a bit about inference dynamics, but that was just a transition subject. I then talked about epistemic views of logical consequence itself. And then a bit more generally, I discussed uh, the phenomenon of implicit and explicit stances at the logic philosophy interface. That's a lot of topics for two lectures at Wuhan, but even so, the epistemology logic interface is still much richer and could easily fill a whole course. And if you're interested in seeing a wide variety of topics, you could read an anthology like the one that I've shown here. And this is really the point where I'd like to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, La, Fanta, Dr. Fanta. Okay, uh, can I share my screen? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, uh, first I want to say uh, thank you, Professor uh, Van Bentham, for this very inspiring talk. And uh, so first I will give a very brief summary of uh, the talk and then turn to my own questions. So in the first part, in the transitioning part, uh, the uh, problem we are talking about is the problem of epistemic distribution. And in the logic of awareness, there is a solution. Uh, there is a distinction between explicit and implicit knowledge. And uh, according to this, implicit knowledge is, uh, uh, it complies with uh, epistemic distribution, but explicit knowledge requires awareness. So it's uh, not closed under uh, known impli uh, implication or it doesn't comply with distribution. So in that sense, uh, we cannot automatically uh, know uh, a logical consequence of our uh, current knowledge because we need to uh, infer that uh, consequence. And then we turn to uh, the epistemic notion of logical consequence. In this part, first, uh, Professor Van Bentham um, introduced the contrast between choose to choose uh, notion of logical consequence and the stopped. Why stopped? Why? <laughs> What's the problem? Panda? I think it is the internet problem. Uh, internet.
Panda, solve your problem quickly. Mm. The stock, your slide is stuck. It's stuck. But we, we don't, we cannot hear you. Also, your slide doesn't move. Uh, we cannot hear you. Also, the slides doesn't move. What's the problem? Quickly. If if not quickly, I will stop you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Maybe Fanda can uh, log out and log in again. And we see your mouse moving. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. 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 <laughs> really sorry for the uh, internet problem. So, uh, no problem. well, since I have taken too much time, uh, I will just uh, put my questions. No, no problem. Now finish yes. your, 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 your. Okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, basically, uh, Okay, so basically, uh, the next part is about the contrast between the two uh, approaches. One is uh, explicit, like in epistemic logic, we have uh, an impl uh, explicit operator, knowledge operator, and the uh, truth-based uh, notion of consequence. And the other uh, approach is implicit, like in the information semantics for intuitionistic logic. So in this approach, we basically reinterprets formulas and logical constants uh, and incorporates knowledge or information into uh, this new interpretation. And uh, then we get uh, an, an information-based uh, notion of logical consequence. But in the language, in the vocabulary, we don't have explicit knowledge operators. So those are the two contrasting uh, approaches. And in the end, Professor Van Bentham provided the connection between uh, the two approaches, that is like uh, uh, in intuitionistic logic and S4, uh, they are inter-translatable. Uh, so basically, if we look at the semantics uh, of the two systems, they are the same mathematical objects, uh, although they can be interpreted in uh, two different ways. So my um, questions, uh, will be, be because my main interest uh, lies in philosophy of language. So uh, most of my questions will be uh, natural language related uh, and my apologies in advance. So there are two uh, sets of questions. First one is about dynamic semantics. Um, Professor Van Bentham uh, mentioned this uh, on the slides but didn't really uh, talk about it. So I'm uh, really curious about um, uh, dynamic semantics and how to uh, like put this into the current framework. So let's take Weltman's uh, update semantics for uh, example. So I think this is uh, uh, a semantics that basically reinterprets formulas, right? We uh, now understand uh, formulas as uh, context change potentials or information state change potentials. So it seems to be an implicit approach, but I wonder whether uh, the fact that the vocabulary now includes uh, an epistemic uh, possibility model uh, 
does this fact make uh, this approach an explicit approach? Or uh, is it, uh, in this count, both explicit is sort of like a hybrid approach? So that's my first question about dynamic semantics. And the second one is that if this um, is implicit or partially implicit, is there a uh, explicit counterpart of this framework? So I wonder whether there is uh, a truth-based system that uh, is intertranslatable with dynamic semantics. And if so, if there is such a uh, explicit counterpart, I wonder whether that will be a dynamic system. So I uh, know uh, Professor Van Benson famously uh, proved that uh, a dynamic system, if uh, it is, it has a static reformulation, if it's both distributive and eliminative, right? And uh, because update semantics is not distributive, I wonder whether the explicit counterpart of it must also be non-distributive. So that's my second question. And my third question in this set is, um, well, we know that in this uh, information-based uh, model, we can define multiple notions of logical consequence. One is uh, uh, borrowing the terminology from Professor Van Bentham's book, uh, Exploring Logical Dynamics. Uh, one is update to test uh, consequence, and the other could be test to test consequence, and many others. So I wonder whether, uh, well, which consequence relation we choose uh, will affect the intertranslatability uh, results between uh, update semantics and its uh, explicit counterpart, assuming that its uh, explicit counterpart exists. So that's uh, my questions in this set. And uh, so I have another uh, set of questions uh, related to the awareness logic. So uh, basically, the problematic case uh, it is supposed to deal with is something like this. Someone knows that P and knows that P implies that Q, but doesn't know that Q. And the solution is basically that um, there is an implicit knowledge operator K and it complies distribution. And the, the, the person implicitly knows that Q in this case, but as uh, explicit knowledge requires awareness uh, uh, this person doesn't explicitly know uh, that Q. Uh, so I'm wondering um, what kind of objects this uh, awareness attitude uh, has. So uh, basically, as in uh, awareness logic, uh, it's represented as sets of formulas, right? And I was wondering whether awareness is an attitude uh, towards syntactic objects, syntactic sentences. Um, so if it's an attitude towards uh, syntactic sentences, I think there will be problems uh, while showing that this choice may be, well, syntactic objects might be too fine-grained. Uh, for example, if uh, still, we suppose that familiar case, right? Uh, and the person knows that it's raining, and also that if it's raining, then uh, the ground is wet, but uh, uh, they don't know that the ground is wet. And suppose the person is, uh, isn't a Chinese speaker. And now I utter the uh, Chinese uh, sentence that, uh, meaning that uh, that person doesn't know that the ground is wet. Right. And this alternative is intuitively informative, but if the object of awareness is a syntactic object, in this scenario, it seems that this utterance in Chinese is not informative because it's our common knowledge that um, Sam doesn't speak Chinese. And of course, he isn't aware of any uh, Chinese sentence. 
Chinese sentences. So uh, I think the situation is sort of interesting because uh, maybe this case can show that uh, syntactic objects of awareness uh, might be too fine-grained, but objects of uh, uh, awareness to be some sort of semantic information, uh, it might be too coarse-grained um, because, well, we may ultimately uh, uh, automatically be aware of like uh, equivalent, semantically equivalent formulas. So that might not be uh, what we want. So I, uh, it would be great if uh, Professor Ren Benzem can uh, talk more about this uh, situation. Uh, so this is all my comments. Well, thank you. These are truly excellent questions. Um, uh, the, um, <clears throat> so let me try to say uh, something briefly. Um, in fact, your questions are so much on the same wavelength with me that I wonder maybe we've met before because <laughs> yeah. anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, let's start with the dynamic semantics question. So um, first, the dynamic semantics case is discussed in my paper in the Journal of Philosophical Logic. So I'll say something briefly about it now. But in that paper, I do discuss Veldman's update semantics. And so let's take a few of your uh, uh, questions. Um, a, one is, how would I classify it? Because the general thinking of the semantics seems information and support based, right? That, that uh, as you say, and I would also say that. But I've been suggesting that that would normally go with just reinterpreting the logical language you already have. And of course, propositional logic clauses do get reinterpreted in the Veldman semantics. But then, as you correctly say, there is this Frank uh, Veldman might, right? So that's a modality which actually tests uh, whether the current information state is not empty. And that's new vocabulary because you don't have that in propositional logic. Yes. So um, from my point of view, uh, I would definitely say that the contrast which I'm making is between extreme pure cases. And in some sense, intuitionism versus epistemic as for logic is an example of such a pure case. But if you look at the reality, you actually see that uh, it's more complicated because implicit systems could actually add vocabulary. Right. And uh, yeah, and, and, and the Feldman modalities. I could say more about that, but that means uh, that's definitely true. So there are mixed cases. Say, if you pressed me to vote, I would say that Veldman system is 83% implicit and 17% explicit. <laughs> Whatever that may mean. <laughs> now, you have some other questions there. Um, uh, one is, um, <clears throat> a, could, I'm, I'm not sure I'm addressing all of them, but let me say something about a few of them. One question, which I actually also consider in the paper is, uh, could we have a 100% explicit counterpart to Veldman semantics? And in the paper, I claim I provide such a system. So it's a sort of version of modal S5 with public announcement logic type announcement operators. But I leave it to you to judge how successful <laughs> that is. Uh, you'd have to, to read my technical solution. But generally speaking, I think there's an interesting general question here. You could always ask yourself if you see a mixed system well, what would happen if you pushed it more to the implicit side or more to the explicit side? So that's actually, I think, generally speaking, an interesting question. And it's definitely, you see, with the Veldman system, I don't know if you were here at my lecture on Friday, if, if you saw the, the presentation of public announcement logic for information update. You see, many people feel that in a way, the Veldman system is very much like PEL. It feels a bit similar, like a, a Veldman update feels like a PEL update. But that's just a sort of feeling about an analogy. Now, PEL is definitely an explicit system. 
right? Uh, yeah. So you could also say the technical question is how exactly does Pell relate to Feldman style update semantics? Okay, that's uh, you know that, that's actually also a technically very interesting question. Then well, one question you asked was um, these implicit systems can actually have um, <clears throat> uh, different notions of consequence. Like in the dynamic case, there's update to test, test to test, and so on. And uh, right, Frundek and Stockhoff, as you know, since you've read my book, even had a different one, right? Uh, okay, good. Um, what does that do to the translations? Well, my experience is very little. It's usually possible um, to, you see, a, you translate, if you take the Gödel translation, then basically, if you take that as an example, you translate the formulas. But apart from that, it's intuitionistic consequence to classical consequence. But if you have different notions of logical consequence on the implicit side, you could actually also manipulate that last step. Uh, so you could add some more operators to. So, for instance, again, in my paper in the Journal of Philosophical Logic, I think I show a bit of this for truthmaker semantics. There's different notions of logical consequence there. But the translation which I give into classical, uh, actually, in that case, I give a translation into classical propositional logic, it can easily be modified to deal with various notions of consequence in truthmaker semantics is you know the basic idea of interpreting the logical operations translating the logical operation stays the same but at the end you add on a little bit of a different <laughs> further information to uh, to deal with the right, you know? so i think that's in itself not a of course there's an interesting philosophical question if you look at the existence of all these variants of consequence in uh, implicit approaches. Uh, this, of course, loosens the connection between what you see in the logical validities and the underlying notion of information. Because right now I have three ways say, of thinking about what. <laughs> so uh, I will then also, you know, what I said was in the implicit approach, the validities of the logic are going to tell you what the view and the, and the non-validities are going to tell you what the view of information is. But if that implicit logic has more notions of logical consequence, I'd really have to say the validities under these various notions of consequence and the non-validities together give me the information about what the view of information is or knowledge is. So that, that's still interesting. So thanks a lot for that first batch of questions, and I'd be happy to discuss this more, maybe on the basis of my paper. Can I move to the awareness questions? So yeah, yeah that's actually yeah, you're raising some 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 very basic issues there. So um, <clears throat> is awareness an attitude directed towards syntax? And I would say frankly, no. <laughs> These awareness models uh, are just very simplistic approaches to what's the difference between implicit and explicit knowledge in, 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 in this sense. In fact, they were first proposed in the computer science literature in the 1980s, and many people criticized these models as having no interest whatsoever, <laughs> because it seems such a technical trick, right, to, to actually relate knowledge to formulas. But as a model, it's still interesting. And in fact, what's surprising is that some 20 years later in economics, people started using these awareness models. <laughs> because also in economics, people started thinking that in economic decision problems, you have to make a distinction between what people know implicitly about their decision problem and what they know explicitly. And it turned out that um, uh, awareness models uh, were actually the only available tools for doing something there. Nevertheless, I totally agree with you that um, uh, that can't be the, the, the real story. So, um, in particular, I think you're making a very uh, important comment. Um, syntax is maybe the most concrete, refined notion of information you could have. Those semantic ranges are about the least fine-grained, right? Uh, 
There's, of course, a lot in between. And this issue in thinking, I really find that the other on. Probably for philosophical purposes, we need to be somewhere in between the naked semantics of semantics information as range and syntax. But where exactly I think that's a really, uh, you know, a whole batch of open conceptual problems. So I, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, we need to understand the intermediate things. Carnap had ideas about that. David Lewis has written about it in general semantics in the early 70s. But um, yeah, I think we don't understand it very well. My last point, I really like the example where you bring up the difference between different languages. As, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, probing what abstraction level we want. Um, the only thing I'll say is that um, uh, I think that's actually a good way of looking at it. It would also be a good way of probing some proposed awareness or, or attention theories. And um, it's interesting that in the literature on epistemic update, such examples have also started appearing as calling for refinement of the current update mechanism. So I could give you uh, references to that. Um, if, yeah, so what you see, uh, yeah, okay, I, I think I'll stop here. I'd, I'd love to discuss this more, but I don't think this is the right place <laughs> for us to do that. Yeah, <laughs> thank okay. you so much. <clears throat> Great questions. Okay, uh, I think uh, uh, there is the uh, outgraduate from Sichuan University, Ouyang Wenfei. Do you like to ask a question uh, to Professor? Yes, yes, I think. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Can you hear me clearly? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, so thank you, Professor Van Benton. So I have a, a very, um, very general question. So uh, maybe two questions, one idea and another is uh, another question. So I think um, apart from translating the truth of non-classical logic into the notion of epistemology, can we translate um, between the logic uh, which use some um, academic notions? For example, we can translate the truth of intuition logic into like knowing how to prove why it's true. So in that way, we can think the notion proof become uh, uh, another kind of knowledge. It's not like no, knowing that, it's like no, know how, or in that way, we can generate a lot of um, epistemic notion like no why, no whether, or obligatory to know something or obligatory to believe something. So I think in that way, we can generate a lot of um, epistemic notion. And so we can use these notions to uh, study what, when we uh, change, the, change the truth to this kind of uh, epistemic notion, what, what logic can we get? So this is my first, maybe it's a, an idea. And another question is, so now we have two kinds of interpretation of logic. So one is, I think is um, metaphysics. So we talk about the truth of, in the world, it's classical logic, but the other is more like epistem epistemology. And I think maybe this is kind, it has a style like mentalism. So the old question comes is what is logic? So we can consider logic to, so in that way, we can also consider logic to describe ability, decision, or emotion. So what here we do to do logic is we can get what from what validly. So like if, we, if you, you are happy and you are not uh, sad, something like that. So I think the notion of logic here can be uh, very general. And so I, 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 as a student, I'm still confused about um, what logicians study and after hearing this. But I think this is very exciting because I think the logic, the notion of logic becomes very, um, because very interesting and, and more wide than I think before. So this is 
my two to my questions yeah. and my idea thank you okay. so thank you um I think I should confine myself to short answers, but um, uh, you know, I'm always happy with questions like yours, you know, to, to continue the conversation, but then you'd have to email to me. So if I, I'll say something brief now, but I, I definitely can't cover uh, everything you're saying. Um, okay, so on this issue of um, extending the range to, to other sorts of knowledge, like knowing whether, knowing how, and so knowing why, um uh, yes that's um there is actually uh, first already hintika in the original epistemic logic did also look at what's called uh, wh knowledge so knowing who or knowing what and um because knowing that right is only one sort of uh, and actually uh, to me one of the, the most interesting uh, research programs in that area is at the moment by uh, Yanjing Wang at uh, uh, Peking University. So he has published a lot on uh, 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 extended epistemic logics, where you can also uh, talk about knowing, say, who committed the crime, knowing what is the value of pi, knowing how to dance the tango. <laughs> well, you know, lots of things like that. And um, he actually proposes, uh, yeah, systems that you could see as far extending uh, what I've given here. As it happens, uh, Yanjing is uh, is an explicit style theorist. <laughs> so generally speaking, he is in favor of translating the implicit approaches uh, to uh, uh, explicit uh, logics in his style. But I I would recommend that. I could say much more about this, but maybe this is enough for now. Yeah, then. What's logic about? Uh, that's, of course, a very interesting issue because uh, I, I haven't discussed that much, but you could say on the truth to truth view, logic is about the most general informational laws in the universe. But it doesn't have a very particular connection with what agents do. Or what, right? As I said, uh, those logical laws would also hold if there were no life. Right, so you, you'd just be on the planet. <laughs> it would still be true that uh, you know uh, if rocks fall, then they crumble. <laughs> the rock falls, so the rock crumbles, even if there were nobody to observe that. Um, but it is true that in these epistemized versions, but also for other reasons in logic, um, the contacts with actual reasoning by actual agents have started getting warmer. And uh, that shows in particular in contacts between logic and cognitive psychology today. But as I said, I'll keep my answer short. Initially, the founding fathers of modern logic actually wanted to see a huge separation here. Frege actually published, uh, and Wittgenstein then continued, uh, uh, this view of anti-psychologism, so that logic should not be about psychological phenomena should not be about what you could actually see when you look at the reasoning of human agents. Um, but in current work, uh, there is a lot of approaching, and I could also send you uh, references on that. So in the most extreme case, you could even think of logicians studying a sort of models for all sorts of actual human reasoning including even the things you talked about. I, I'm totally with you. Um, I think there could also be a logic of smiles or a logic of facial expressions, <laughs> you know, or a logic of emotions that you convey. However, this raises an enormous philosophical issue because what's the status of the validity? In cognitive psychology, you study actual behavior, but say, if the actual behavior of humans were logically completely irresponsible and strange, you'd still have to say those are the laws of human reasoning, because that's what we actually do. But logic also has normative aspects, like what you should conclude, what you should do. How these two things match, that's a whole set of complicated issues. Okay, that's all I'll say for now. Okay, so do write to me if you want to continue this conversation. Uh, oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we can have a last question. Who? Hello? Uh, can I ask a question? 
Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Johan. Thank you for your nice talk. Uh, I am very interested in the discussion between the implicit approach and the explicit approach. Uh, for the intertranslation between the two approaches, I think I can think of two kinds of tasks in the translation. One task of translation is that given a formula phi, uh, we needed to find some uniform way to translate the phi into phi prime such that uh, phi is true or spotted in one semantics whenever phi prime is true or spotted in the, in the other semantics. And the other kind of task is in the translation uh, such that uh, we already have one complete excitation uh, in one approach and we want to uh, have a complete axiom system in the other approach. Usually this cannot be done just by simply translating each axiom in one approach into the other uh, one by one. So this is no trivial task. So I want to ask when you mentioned the intertranslation between uh, the implicit approach and the explicit approach, uh, whether it concerns both kind of tasks or only concerns one, the first kind of tasks. Thank you. So uh, just to make sure, Kaibo, um, uh, in this second task, so the first task would be, let's say, correlating, right, uh, say, um, a formula is supported somewhere. How do you correlate that with some other translated formula is true? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's like correlating the sort of talk or the sort of description of situations that uh, yeah. we're including. Is the second task correlating the actual axiomatizations? Yes. Yeah. 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 So that is, of course, that often doesn't follow from the translations. And even in the case of intuitionistic logic and S4, uh, that actually, yeah, uh, you need a lot of further combinatorial thinking about this. Yes. So, for instance, uh, suppose that you have the Gödel translation. Could you have predicted Heiting's axiomatic proposition? No. Logic? I don't think so. Um, but I'm also saying this depends a bit because there's also an open problem here. Maybe in the right sort of proof format, we could actually find something. Suppose that, say, you have a Genson style cut free calculus for S4. Maybe you have so much control over the structure of the proof then <laughs> that the translation would tell you a lot about what a Genson sequent calculus for intuitionistic logic would look like. But to give you, make that even more concrete, as you know, in the proof theoretic perspective, Right, intuitionistic logic arises by allowing at most one consequent in sequence, so you can't have multiple consequences. So you'd have to somehow see that under the translation, you wouldn't need multiple consequences. But the, the only thing I'm saying is um, whether you can get information, say, the more information you have of the actual proof format in one of these logics, mm. the more chance you have of getting more information about the proof format or the complete proof formats for the other. But I agree that's uh, full of, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so that second task is definitely requires additional, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, additional uh, study, right, Common, uh, yeah. Yeah, of a control or proof theoretic, uh, proof theoretic nature. In fact, what I say in my JPL paper is actually the translations I know, and also my whole discussion in that paper of the contrast is semantic. Mm -hmm. Gödel translation also, of course, it's a syntactic translation, but it's motivation. Yes, right? yes you understand motivation. how it works by thinking about the semantics. So, um, I, I do ask the question, suppose that I didn't have semantics, suppose that I wasn't diehard truth theorist, like my teacher, Professor Leuk, who claimed <laughs> that he didn't, understand, he didn't understand what semantic models were, and he definitely didn't understand what truth meant, right? Of course he did, but he claimed he didn't. Um, now, uh, so then you would want the whole contrast explained in proof theoretic terms. And actually what I admit in the paper is I don't even know how to tell that story exactly. It's also very interesting uh, what would happen. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and I think somehow, right, <laughs> your second task, I relate to the proof theory. Yes. Uh, okay, I think the time is up. 
we should stop here. We can <laughs> so uh, thank you. Uh, thank Professor Johan von Benson very much for your informative, stimulating, and very clear organized whole lectures. Uh, also thanks. Uh, Professor Chen Rong, uh, Dr. Fan Da, uh, good comments and questions, and all the other attendants, uh, discussion, and all the friends who attended the two lectures by Professor Fong Benson. So, uh, let's expect further cooperation. Uh, further lectures uh, by Professor von Benson to us. Uh, I think we're due. Okay, we stop here. Uh, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.